Welcome to Cooperative Conversations, the live stream series where we connect you to the real stories of Australian primary producers who are working and growing together in cooperatives. Hi, my name's Pete Lewis, and one way or another, I've been helping Australian farmers tell the great stories of food and fibre production here for the past 25 years. Tonight, we're being joined by a wonderful group of people, starting with the Federal Minister for Industry, Science and Technology, the Honourable Karen Andrews. Larry McHugh, who is the CEO of Marquis Macadamia. Matt Rutter, who is the CEO of the Geraldton Fisherman's Co-op. Simon Stahl, the CEO of the Northern Cooperative Meat Company in the New South Wales Northern River. And Michael Hampson, who is the CEO of Norco, also in that neck of the woods. And of course, last but not least, Melina Morrison, who is the CEO of the Business Council for Cooperatives and Mutual. Welcome, everybody, and thanks so much for your time. Tonight, we're discussing how farm cooperatives can be key contributors to growing a successful and sustainable domestically owned food and beverage manufacturing sector. The opportunity for a manufacturing-led economic recovery with a focus on advanced food manufacturing has become part of the national conversation largely due to the need to find ways to add value to farm incomes, as well as to local economies as we recover from the pandemic. We're also looking and really keen to get your input. So we want to involve you and get you to join the conversation by our poll for tonight. The question is, value added production is an opportunity for Australian farmers to diversify and improve farm income. Should we do more to value add food and beverage manufacturing in Australia? answer in the chat box to the right of the screen. Joining in this conversation tonight, we're very pleased to have, as I said, the Honourable Karen Andrews, the Federal Minister for Industry, Science and Technology, to kick off and take part in the discussion and outline the government's vision for Australia going forward. Good evening, Minister, and thanks again for joining us tonight. You recently gave a speech outlining your reasons for believing that Australia can secure our economic sovereignty by building an even stronger local advanced food and beverage manufacturing sector. What is that opportunity, Minister, and what are the building blocks we need to make it happen? Okay, well, thank you so much for the opportunity to join in the discussion today. And it's a discussion that I think is so important for Australia. I'd just like to uh, spend a bit of time putting a, a bit of context around where we find ourselves now, because this provides us with a platform, with an opportunity that, quite frankly, is uh, once in a lifetime, uh, probably, uh, definitely once in a generation opportunity that we're facing um, now. So uh, we're all aware that, um, that Australia has done pretty well in steering its way through the COVID um, crisis. And that's um, thanks a lot to uh, our, our businesses around Australia, our cooperatives, who have done uh, such an amazing amount of, of work. So congratulations and thank you for that. Uh, when we actually look at Australia's economy and the options for us going forward, this is the time for us to reassess our opportunities for the future. Now, as the industry minister, I look um, broadly across all industry sectors, and I've been doing that now for, uh, seriously, for the last 18 in months. What we have to do now is revisit some of that work with what I call the COVID lens, to look at what we've learned out of the COVID experience and how we position ourselves for the future. Now, it's clear that we have some uh, very long-standing skills and expertise in areas such as mining and resources, but we also have um, a, a very strong skills in the agriculture sector. And if you look at opportunities for the future, we have to build on what our strengths already are, which is mining resources and food and ag. And we also need to look at emerging opportunities. And that could include looking at the space sector, it could look at uh, plastics recycling, it could look at uh, be looking at defence. But I guess for the purposes of today, I'll actually focus on food and ag in particular. So 25% uh, of Australia's manufacturing is food related. And we have enormous opportunities for us to build on what is already a strong food manufacturing base. We can do that with um, uh, meat processing, but we can also um, do that with our cropping and our, our processing of um, those crops and grains. Now, I had some discussions with 
um, many of my my counterparts overseas, but in Southeast uh, Asia about 12 months ago about what the opportunities are. Singapore was particularly interested in working with us to develop uh, opportunities. Clearly, they can't grow enough um, uh, food to support their own uh, needs, so they're looking at what the opportunities are with us. Um, vegetarian veganism is now um, certainly trending around the world. Many people are moving away from um, meat-based to plant-based uh, foods. And particularly with many of our nearest neighbours, uh, looking at um, plant-based foods is something that they're very keen for us to do. What we need to do is make sure that we are um, continuing to be world-leading with our primary producers but also looking at building our manufacturing opportunities in, um, in, in food and developing those markets. Now, given that we are a population of about 25 million, we have to develop export markets. Uh, we currently produce enough food to feed ourselves, more than enough, at least triple time the, the amount that we need. But let's look at growing and developing those markets. So I see that uh, we have enormous opportunity in food and beverage uh, to expand our manufacturing uh, base, but we have to be very niche and targeted with what we're doing. I think as Australians, we've spent a lot of time uh, trying to please everyone, to be all things to all people, and now we have to look at where our strengths are and how we maximise those opportunities. Well, as you said, Australia's been the breadbasket for the region for decades. Is it the government's view that we should be investing more in adding value to our raw product here in Australia? Value adding is one of the most important things that we can be doing. And if I use um, the, the mining and resources sector here, we've been criticised for 30 years, if not longer, for the fact that we are exceedingly good at digging um, our minerals out of the ground, very good at putting them on uh, ships and sending them overseas, where we then spend an enormous amount of money buying them back uh, because someone else has value added to that. We need to change that. We also need to change it in our food and ag areas as well. So, yes, I'm very focused on uh, value-add because that's where we're going to have the biggest impact in our uh, economy, quite frankly. So, yes, the value-add is going to be very important. We do want to con uh, concentrate on our, um, our food processing and building on our capabilities. How important is innovation to small, medium enterprises in the food industry, whether they're part of a cooperative or not? Yep, it's um, it's it's absolutely critical. And look, you know, sometimes um, innovation is not perceived in the positive light that I think that it should be. Many people get very concerned about innovation and technology, and I think it's because they're concerned that they're going to lose their jobs through innovation and uh, robotics in particular is going to mean that um, there will be fewer jobs. The point that I like to make is that the jobs of the future are going to be very different. So if you even um, look at, at our past history, jobs that were available 10 years ago have changed, you know, considerably, but it's been a slower transition uh, and people have been more willing to be part of that change process. When people look to the future, they think that it's coming towards them at a great pace. And in many cases, quite frankly, let's be honest, um, it is coming at us very quickly. But we do need to look at, at innovation. We need to look at uh, certainly what businesses are already doing every single day, whether it's looking at a new product, a new process, a new way of doing things. Uh, all of that is part of innovation. And it just means that uh, these are opportunities for us to do better. Well, as you move around the country uh, and you engage with the sector, do you get a sense there's a willingness to look at new processes, new products? Absolutely, because many people just see it as the, uh, the the work that they do every single day. You know, how am I going to build this faster? How am I going to produce this? Uh, how am I going to produce a better product? What do I need to do yeah, I'm in the egg space? What do our primary producers need to do to maximise what their outcomes are going to be? This is what um, business um, owners in particular look at every single day. So, yes, there is a, a willingness. Some of them are a little bit puzzled that all of a sudden, um, you know, it, it gets rebadged as innovation and it's something that everyone wants to uh, jump on, on board with. But there is. There is a very strong interest in doing things better in Australia and maximising opportunities, and that's what innovation is. One of the things that certainly come out of this series is that uh, the food sector in general has really emerged as a strong performer during COVID-19. 
They have just kept the wheels turning. They've kept the supply lines open. And uh, notwithstanding some panic buying, they've managed to provide Australians with all the things that they require. Uh, is that a pretty fair view? Look, the, the, the food sector actually did really very well. The issue was more of a restocking issue than a supply issue. So, yes, when there was the panic um, buying and, you know, to be honest, I thought that I would be at one stage spending the rest of my life talking about toilet paper and the need not to panic buy toilet um, paper. Um, and that really has come in a, a little bit in, in cycles. But there was a rush on um, some food products such as, you know, pasta, uh, flowers, uh, tomatoes, tin tomatoes in, in particular. So there was a bit of panic buying there and there were some restocking issues where we just couldn't get the product onto the shelves uh, as quickly as it was being uh, purchased. But I think that what people realised is that we do have good food supplies here in Australia and we also have a high quality product. Uh, that makes us very attractive for people as they're looking for those sorts of uh, products here in Australia but it also makes us a very attractive option overseas because we are seen food-wise to be clean, green, and we're also seen now as uh, very dependable. So, again, this is the opportunity that COVID has presented us that we need to maximise. Well, dependable is, a, uh, is an appropriate word, I guess. Do you get a sense that Australia now has a slightly higher regard for farmers and the food sector generally than, may have, uh, than it may have had six months ago? Yeah. Absolutely, because I think they've all figured out now where their food uh, actually comes from in the, in the first place. And I think they also understand how hard it has been for a lot of our primary producers over the last few years. They've been hit by drought, they've been hit by um, bushfires, but, you know, they're still in there and they're producing it at, um, at, at a level that is making sure that we have the ability to feed ourselves here in Australia. So, uh, yes, where would we be without our farmers, quite frankly? Thank you, Minister. Strong evidence that uh, food and beverage manufacturing have a key role to play in the Australian economy. We're fortunate to have uh, tonight a very strong group of Australian food producers who are all involved in adding value to farming in one way or another. It's a great opportunity to hear from Aussie co-ops from right around the country. They're leading the way in pivoting their production processes in order to value add. All of our guests tonight are working to control supply lines, utilise technology, boost local employment, upskill their workers, and improve operations to boost productivity and competitiveness, all of which supports improved access to domestic markets and, of course, important international export markets. Let's talk to our guests and find a little bit about their plans for value adding, starting with Michael Hampson, CEO of Norco. Now, there's probably possibly not a better known cooperative brand in the country than Norco. They've been going for 125 years. So you must know uh, a few, a thing or two, Michael, about how to add value to dairy products and also how to keep uh, farmers in business. Tell us a little bit about Norco and uh, what foods you manufacture and how your cooperative works. Thanks, Pete. Uh, Norco has been around for 125 years and yes, we have, uh, we have value added a lot of uh, dairy product over that time. We currently manufacture a, a fairly full range of, of, of milk product, fresh milk products for both uh, Australia and overseas. We, we export fresh milk over to uh, China and parts of Southeast Asia. Uh, we also have a bunch of specialty products where our team have innovated to find different mixes of proteins and fats that provide um, enhanced uh, milk for coffee frothing, etc. through our vibrant route business that we have. We also have a, an award-winning um, range of, of, of flavoured milks that Norco uh, markets under, under its brands throughout our heartland also. Uh, in addition to our fresh milk business, we also have an ice cream business. We make about 55 million litres of, uh, of ice cream here at our, our factory at uh, Lisbon. And we have that in uh, tub formats, pots, extruded sticks. Um, and we, again, we do that for the domestic market, a fairly big domestic focus there, but also international business where we send it, send our ice cream uh, into China and the US and, and other countries, both for the food service and also the retail channel. In that, that business this year, we've got about 35 new products that, that would have been launched th this year as well. So we've got a, a fair amount of activity that we, um, that, we, uh, that we have in terms of innovation in our product space, but also in our processes where we've, we've looked to make significant investment over the, over the years so we can really pull out the, the supply chain costs 
and, and lower our internal, our, our internal costs so we can provide more value back to the farmers. And this year, we've actually provided an additional about $18 million more to um, our dairy farmer members in higher milk prices this year than what we have done uh, in, in the prior year, which is really good for our members in that, in that really tough time around the drought. Before the pandemic, you had, uh, you had plans for expanding your ice cream factory. How many jobs would that have created? And uh, is there anything preventing you from uh, following through on that strategy? Yeah, well, Norco is very much a, has a strong reputation of being a quality and reliable manufacturer of, of, of ice cream in both Australia and overseas. So we have got some, some significant growth plans for that business. Paying out an additional $18 million to our members in high milk prices over the year, which is they desperately needed because it was you know, the worst drought in living memory, that sort of depletes the capital reserves of our, of, of our business somewhat. So we would be keen to, uh, to, to continue those, those plans because you know, we would see an extra 30 or 40 jobs come in our site. But not only that, but there's you know, 200 people that are employed at that particular site also, that this, that this kind of investment just underpins that employment in our region of Lismore, which isn't necessarily a high employment area, it's actually a low, a low it is a high unemployment area, um, that would provide um, you know, security for those jobs for the next 10 to 15 years, which is which would be very important for our region. Thanks, Michael. Uh, we have a question now from the audience, this one from Simon Lane, who's one of the Cooperative Farming Project envoys, and also the former chairman of Armand Co Australia, a South Australian-based almond processing company. My question is to the panel. Since you've been adding value in your business, what benefits has this brought to your local community, to your members, and to your region? Now, who would like to have a go at that first up? I could certainly take an answer to that if that was okay. Most definitely. So I, I, Nor Norco operates in, a, in, a, in very much a regional regional areas from a very large geographical spread from Kingaroy in the north to Heatherbrae in the, Heatherbrae in the south. We, we employ 850 people across that, across that, um, that geographical footprint. We're an organisation that returns um, by far the vast amount of value that we create into the local community. We do that through wages, we do that through investment, and we do that through um, paying a leading milk price to our dairy farmer members. And that is the that is the core part of how our business operates. We have a we have a, a board of six uh, directors. Those six directors are dairy farmers. Um, so the governance structure of our organisation is very much set up to ensuring that we are taking a holistic supply chain view across um, our entire geography, not just a, a business profitability um, lens. We are looking at entire supply chain and industry sustainability and that's the role that we that we that we look to um to play in the industry and the last 12 months is certainly an example of that where we've been able to put an additional 18 million dollars out there in milk price on top of the um about 150 million dollars in just in milk price that we would normally put out plus the additional um couple hundred million dollars in wages that we pay over that particular um region and these are all regional Australia based from again Kingaroy in the north to Heather Bray in, in, in New South Wales in the south. Well what are some of the others uh, of you think about it? Larry? Look our cooperatives um, continue to, to bring money into the community since 1983 and the industry has grown a lot in that time so I think that uh, you know the Lismore region has done very well from, from our cooperative and others. Simon Stahl from the uh, Northern Cooperative Meat Company. Yeah, look, I think there's obviously the financial returns to the community. There's the employment, there's our, there's our sponsorship of local events and um, local charities. But I think it also brings a sense of pride to a community to feel that they actually belong to this uh, uh, international business, that it's their own um, and that they get to go to an AGM and vote on it. I think that the intrinsic value of that alone is, is worth a hell of a lot to Matt Rutter, is Geraldton proud to ride on the back of rock lobsters? Yeah, very proud. We're obviously one of the primary industries in Geraldton, but we're across all of the coastal towns, um, up and down a thousand kilometres of coastline, which to be honest, wouldn't exist some of those smaller towns if uh, there wasn't the rock lobster industry generating the, the local economy because there's simply no other 
um, no other business that goes on there, but it underpins then the tourism in those towns. Um, it also gives a sense of identity. I agree with um, with what's been said earlier around uh, you know the sense of identity linking in with this really important community resource. Um, so, like I say, it's it's fundamental to those regional towns. They simply, in our case, um, probably fifty percent of them would simply not exist. Matt, let's go to you and your co-op. Your cooperative handles a very different product to Norco, seafood. Tell us a bit more about the Geraldton Fisherman's Cooperative and the value adding you're involved in. Yeah, thanks, Pete. And thanks for the opportunity to talk today in this really important project. And I'd just like to congratulate BCCM and the cooperative farming team for what I think is a really valuable exercise of sharing, sharing these stories. Um, it's interesting actually, because listening to uh, Michael, on uh, the story of Norco, you could, there's a lot of parallels actually in terms of our regional spread, the return to the community um, and, and the business model and the way that we measure success in terms of value return back to our members. So we are, um, the, the main difference is that our primary producers are on the ocean and they're catching Western Rock Lobster, which is um, the largest wild caught fishery in Australia, uh, we export approximately 4 million kilos of the product each year, so around about $400 million worth of high value seafood into the international market. And over the last 70 years, our members have um, essentially built their supply chain all the way from the beach, stretching across a thousand kilometres of coastline um, through to a central um, a central exporting facility in Perth, and then from there supplying the product all around the world, as well as into their own company, which they wholly own within China and supplying literally to customers' doors um, in China. So we've invested, um, and over that 70 years, the members have worked together and, um, and have really built a highly efficient and um, top quality supply chain. Um, our core business is receival, storage and uh, marketing of, of the lobster, but we also provide additional services which benefit our members, which includes things such as marine supplies, uh, boat lifting, quota sourcing. We have a fish and chip shop and a few other things which returns value to, um, value to the local communities as well. Um, so essentially we're a shared services model where our members benefit from economies of scale and, and working together and all of the measures of uh, that Michael spoke about earlier in terms of making sure that we're maximising revenue and minimising costs very much apply to us as well. Um, in terms of the value adding, when you start talking about value adding, you know, top of the list for me really is in terms of the, the, the ways that we value add, top of the list for me really is working together as a cooperative. So we have a couple of hundred members who individually, if they didn't have their cooperative, would be selling to uh, independent buyers. Um, they wouldn't be getting the benefits of working together under a common brand and a common supply chain um, to ensure that the maximum value is returned back to them as the primary producers. But on top of that, obviously, um, it, you know, we've, we have the brand, the way that we sell um, our lobsters overseas is really important to us. So we auction the product every day on online uh, to ensure that every single day as a live product, we're selling to the highest payers in the market, um, as well as exploring other opportunities such as selling by e-commerce uh, in China in particular. So selling individual live lobsters across China into consumers' homes. So. Um, those are the ways that we that we add value and um, again fundamental it's a very it's a very simple business model fundamentally we aim to maximize revenue minimize costs and return as much back to our members which ultimately returns value back into the communities that they live in now critically of course your business requires air freight to uh, get the lobsters from Western Australia to many of their overseas markets. And air freight was obviously seriously compromised during the pandemic crisis. Did being a cooperative help you resolve some of those challenges? Yeah, well, they were certainly significant challenges because we essentially, uh, we were hit by COVID when China went down because over 90% of our product goes to China. And as China was starting to regain its foothold and was starting to come out and, and consume again, 
uh, the world's airlines airline fleets were grounded. So at the at the time we worked very closely with the federal government, and again we got some assistance with BCCM around this. And I think a fundamental message to the government as a cooperative is that we could we were speaking on behalf of hundreds of um, uh, member families and the beneficiaries of the fishery, rather than speaking as a corporate who was looking at their own bottom line. We're looking at the bottom line of hundreds of individual businesses and we could show the government how we could, if they could help us to get the, the planes back in the air, how we could return that value back into the communities, which obviously is critical at a time like this. And we were fortunate enough through those discussions that the federal government um, gave our industry the first grant under the International Freight Assistance Mechanism um, which meant that we could get the fishes back in the water, we could get the planes back in the air and the product flying, and most importantly, export revenues back into the back into the regions. That's great, Matt. And I guess, Minister, this is just another really good example of where the federal government did step up with targeted assistance for particular needs. In this case, rock lobster fishermen from WA. It uh, seems to have really hit the spot. Absolutely. And uh, we were only really able to provide that level of very targeted support because of the engagement that we had uh, with the, the sector and um, their ability to feed through to us exactly what was uh, needed. So we were pretty pleased to be able to uh, support because it was really important. Now, clearly what, um, what has been demonstrated for us during our COVID is freight issues. So there were significant issues getting product into the country and also pro getting product out of the, the country. So, and it's still difficult, uh, quite frankly. We, we certainly aren't back to uh, anywhere near uh, the levels that we, we need to with freight so that we can export the products that we, we need. But it is important that we do all keep working um, together. And uh, you know, as we've just heard, uh, the payback to the community has been absolutely enormous. So uh, again, thank you very much. Let's take a question that's been submitted by uh, our audience. This one from Rob Horn, who's a cattle producer from Dungog in New South Wales. And here's his question. Minister, a key driver for manufacturing is our export capability. Co-ops can help small and medium businesses access export markets. What else do we need to do to improve access to export markets for our small and medium farming and food enterprises? Look, good question, because export markets are vitally important to us here, uh, particularly given the size of our, our nation. And it is important that we are looking at as many export markets that we can access. So there's a couple of opportunities for us to work together. Through my own department, there's Oz Industry, and I'm keen to make sure that we've got um, a high level of engagement so that we can look at how we can develop appropriate export uh, markets, and I mean appropriate in terms of the product that we have and where that's best suited uh, in a, a global market. So we've got Oz Industry that uh, that we can call on and will be calling on. We've also got uh, Oz Trade that does a lot of work with uh, assisting businesses to access uh, export markets. I think it's time that we have a very coordinated approach for that. And one of the things that um, that we know from uh, the way that cooperatives uh, work is that you can get a level of scale there for markets. Now, we did discover during the, um, the, the COVID crisis that many of our manufacturers, in particular our producers, were small, couldn't supply the demands that we needed in a time of crisis. So here's an opportunity for, um, for cooperatives to really start um, accessing export markets and the way to do that is through Oz Industry and through Oz Trade. Thanks for that. Now we'll talk to Simon Stahl. He's the CEO of the Northern Cooperative Meat Company. Now like Norco, NCMC hails from the Northern Rivers region of New South Wales. Simon, what's the structure of your co-op and what do you process and manufacture? Um, yeah, look, the structure of our co-ops are straightforward in terms of membership. We've got around 900 members uh, from quite a quite a wide uh, area from Victorian border up into the far north in Queensland. Um, I guess in terms of structure, one thing we are quite unique is that the the members are only required to supply uh, a small amount of their produce to stay what we call wet shareholders in the group, and and I think uh, that in part 
uh, giving the members that choice to um, sell their produce elsewhere is probably why we're still around today. Um, but of course, that advantage for the members is a disadvantage for us. So we've got to get that balance right. But I think it's worth pointing out that's a quite a unique relationship with our membership. In terms of what we produce, we uh, process uh, beef uh, and pork. Uh, we do the slaughtering, we do the deboning. Um, and over the last couple of years, we've started to develop our own retail ready processing rooms, um, which we've now got direct brands into the Coles and the Woolworths or the major um, retailers of the country. And just as importantly, we've started doing those retail packs into uh, Asia in particular. And as with previous discussions, we, on, we do believe that that is where uh, the future lies in terms of value, value adding in our, in our world. The other interesting part to our processing is we have a wet glue hide factory. Um, so obviously a byproduct of processing cattle is the hide. Uh, wet blue or tanning is the first stage of leather making. And there's one of only three um, uh, sheds in Australia that do the wet blue process. And I am one of the view that um, we should be doing more textiles manufacturing in Australia. So I'm um, uh, looking forward to working with the minister on that as we go forward. So, I mean, you're involved in a, in, in a, in a local collaboration of cooperatives. Uh, can you tell us about the Cooperative Alliance and how the group works together to overcome roadblocks such as energy and labour costs? Look, we formed the collective uh, probably five or six years ago now. And, and one thing that's really important, and that's why you become a cooperative in the first place, is to keep on looking for that innovative piece about scale uh, and synergies. And, and by uh, the Northern Rivers is actually uh, probably the capital of cooperatives in Australia. So it was an opportunity to get with big manufacturers such as Norco, uh, the sugar mills, uh, down to the small fishermen's co-ops uh, to meet regularly um, as we do and talk about what are some of the um, issues that actually cross all of our divide. And further to that, what are the synergies in our business? Should we be, should, could we be swapping some information around engineering? Um, Michael's company, Norco, and, and us are working together in China. Uh, and so those opportunities for us uh, Australian-owned companies to um, get some scale and work together is a terrific opportunity, and that's what we do in that group. Thanks, Simon. Now, following on from our earlier conversation with Larry McHugh, CEO of Marquee Macadamias, welcome back. I'm interested to hear your views on the economic value already created through cooperative food processing ventures. Well, I think that um, the other speakers today have, have kind of highlighted what our businesses do in regional areas. In my opinion, they turn small, less viable businesses into world-class enterprises. Australia has a um, unique, clean, green image around the world, an image of stability. And by bringing a whole lot of smaller growers together, we're able to harness their power and access the world with that clean green image. So in the case of our company, we've had 350 growers get together and that's enabled us to approach some of the biggest retailers around the world to get products onto their shelf. Our, those retailers love the fact that we are owned by growers and they use it as part of their story. Consumers love to know where their product comes from and a cooperative lends itself to, to that sort of selling. What happens then is that um, because of our overseas footprint, we sell 70% of our, of our product overseas. Um, we're generating a lot of export dollars into Australia. And as with the other cooperatives, that money's coming back into Australia, but most importantly, it's coming into our regional areas. So our 350 growers are all paid for their product. And, and you know, we, as with Norco, we give almost all the money back to growers, except what's needed for, for future expansion. That money is then used by them to employ people, to buy products in the local area. We're also buying products in the local area. So we're generating overseas dollars, bringing them into areas, creating jobs and um, creating money flowing through these areas, which would otherwise um, not have a lot of money flowing through them. Give us a bit of a feel for the potential of this growth. How big do you think it actually could get? Um, uh, there's the world, the world's the oyster, you know, if we're talking in particular about macadamias, um, the macadamia industry around the world is growing very quickly. Um, and Australia is, is uh, up there with the second or the, or the largest in the world, depending on the year. 
Um, and that's a very valued product around the world. We're a very scarce tree nut and, and people love the product around the world. So um, I think having a, a, a cooperative base is really helping us access world markets. We now have a um, world leading macadamia marketing company in our stable and we intend to build the product as very prominent around the whole world. What are the, um, do you actually also help sell the message at the same time that this is a, a Queensland nut and not one from Hawaii? Because uh, anybody who's spent even a short amount of time in Hawaii would, uh, would tend to think they invented it. Uh, that is true. And unfortunately that uh, myth is perpetrated in China where the translation for the name of the nut is Hawaiian nut. Um, we spend a lot of time pointing this out to people, but unfortunately um, there's been a lot of work beforehand from the Hawaiians, so it's, it's taking us some time to get there. But certainly when we're dealing with the supermarkets and manufacturers of the world, they're well aware that it's an Australian product and that we're growing it in the region that it was meant to be grown in, and that's one of our big selling points. Back to Karen Andrews now. Minister, can you see how the government can work more closely with the cooperative sector on advanced food manufacturing opportunities? So uh, absolutely there are opportunities for us to continue the level of engagement we've had over the last um, uh, couple of months in particular. I'm very keen to, to do that because what COVID has demonstrated very clearly is that we're all going to achieve much more for Australia when we do have that high level of engagement and cooperation for the future. So we need to keep that engagement going. It's very important that we hear from the sectors about um, the issues that they're facing so that we can provide some very targeted support as we've, um, we've discussed earlier in today's discussion. So I think that's all very important. I'm very keen to continue to, to work with the, the sector and continue the engagement that we've had particularly recently. Thanks, Minister. I want to bring Melina Morrison into the conversation now. Melina, you advocate for better awareness of the cooperative business model. Why is it important to include cooperatives in any discussion about advanced manufacturing, in your view? Thanks for the question, Pete. And thanks to all of these great case studies. We've really heard it from the horse's mouth, so, so to speak, tonight. Uh, we've heard that the great advantage that you have when you cooperate is that you can scale into export markets. You can uh, make sure that the lion's share of the value that you're creating comes back to the far farm gate. You can share the costs of investing in advanced processing facilities across a range of producers. Um, you can manage the costs of production to make it all much more feasible and profitable to be in, in, in advanced areas of manufacturing. Um, but most importantly, Cooperatives do um, a very, very important thing to scale enterprise. They enable small independent um, producers to uh, come together and compete in many markets. Um, and we heard it from the minister before, we really need to build on our home growing capacity. We need to be able to scale, particularly into export markets. But at the same time as that is scaling is happening, local ownership is retained. And that means that more of the value is captured back into the local economy. It's returned and reinvested. When cooperatives are able to scale, they create new high quality jobs. And the minister and the other speakers have always already spoken about how they can create value for the wider community tonight. So, um, so that's really important because as we need to power out of this crisis and any crisis in the future, we need to be able to boost the regional economy and make sure that as we scale um, and enter new areas of, of manufacturing and processing, hopefully, that we're also capturing that value. Um, and that's what cooperatives do in, in spades. Thanks, Melina. Now we go to a video question, which has been submitted all the way from Carnarvon in Western Australia. Let's go to a question from Doriana Mangili from the Sweeter Banana Cooperative. Hi to the panel. Cooperatives are great at coming up with solutions to overcome problems, but our achievements are often overlooked. I'm really proud at how Sweeter Banana has overcome challenges with new solutions, whether that's our banana bread um, after a cyclone event to use up damaged fruit, um, our self-insurance fund, or um, even the innovation of the lunchbox bananas. 
Why do you think we don't hear more about cooperatives? Yeah, uh, I agree. Fantastic question, Doriana. And um, I think the big thing for cooperatives is first and foremost, getting the word out to the, to the Australian public and letting them really understand the co-op model and letting them know that the majority of them are actually members of cooperatives already and the benefits that they get um, back to themselves um, through whatever cooperative model or mutual model that they're a member of. Um, and then I think the next piece is really what we're doing today. We've just got to get out there and share the story. And I think I, from my conversations through COVID, I think that people really, you know, the concept of we're all in it together, which um, everyone thinks is a, COVID, um, is a COVID concept, is really at the core of what cooperatives are. And we are all in it together. We need to work together um, within our cooperatives, between our cooperatives and with the wider community. And um, so I think we've just really got to start sharing our successes. I think we've all been focused on doing a good job and, and focused on our members. But I think, you know, remember the, the seventh core principle of, of communities and making sure that the communities see the benefit that they get from um, the co-ops either directly or indirectly. And Simon, I guess the whole thrust of the Cooperative Alliance is that there's great strength in numbers. Yeah, absolutely. I think... Um... I agree with Matt, it's about getting the message out, out uh, and particularly to the city folk. And I think um, the BCCM has started to do that in spades. Um, I still find it interesting that um, there's a lot of city people don't really get it. Um, and they don't really understand it. And I think if they did understand more, they would look to support cooperatives even further. Um, and, and so I think that education process has to continue for the better of our organisations. And as Matt's saying too, we've got a part to play in that. And, and we do that through the, um, the Cooperatives Alliance as well. And Michael, obviously you wear it very proudly in your uh, in your company name, it's, it's Norco. It's uh, it's right front and centre. And by from what you've said, it, it really drives everything you do. Absolutely, our, our brand of Norco, um, we, we we spend a lot of time talking to our consumers about what that really means and what we do. And that's sort of, and that's been invested over a long period of time. And I think now that our, our customers and consumers are starting to understand exactly what that means, considering now that we're the fastest growing white milk brand in the country, which is fantastic. Good to hear. Look, as luck has it, we will be hearing from Doriana in our next cooperative conversation profiling her innovative Sweeter Banana Cooperative. Now, Doriana's got a really interesting story to tell about rising out of tough competition, dealing with cyclones, pioneering the lunchbox banana, and remaining profitable while working together. It's a terrific story out of Carnarvon in Western Australia. To find out more about that episode and to check out all the episodes and part of this series in Cooperative Conversations, go to Conversations dot coop farming dot coop to find our full lineup of episodes and remember the series is available now and on demand for tonight we're just about out of time but i do want to thank every member of our panel for the great uh, uh, involvement and of course your questions as well work out really well hope you've enjoyed it until we uh, assemble again that's this for now see you next time